camp happening as well, finishing off this morning. And uh, I was at the kids camp yesterday and I looked around, I was quite struck by the fact that um, about 12 of the leaders and the junior leaders who are at camp have come through our kids ministry. How awesome is that? You know, and about four other leaders have come through all the way through our kids or youth ministry. I mean, that's, that's the predominant number of people who are serving, you know, were coming out of our kids and youth ministry. And I thought, that's really healthy. That is so good. And Pastor Alan and Pastor Jill, to see the breakout kids come along and the way that they just connected in so beautifully and the, in, the, the aha moments and the sense of warmth and joy that they were experiencing in that family environment was just so beautiful. It was a number of our Friday night breakout kids, some of them probably have never experienced that kind of environment outside of church before. It was just, I was so moved. It was awesome. So when you go to pick up your kids or when you see our kids and youth leaders, encourage them, thank them. They're doing an amazing job and re- reaping lasting fruit for our kingdom, how else is, for God's kingdom. How awesome is that? So good. Well, have you ever cooked something and left out an essential ingredient? No one wants to put up their hand because it's embarrassing. <laughs> I have, the usual giveaway with my kids is the, the eyes that go really wide off across the table after they've tasted it. And then the, the awkward like side eye to each other. <laughs> Until I break the silence and say, it's okay, I can own it. I know this isn't my best work, that's fine. And we all have a little laugh. And then they proceed to tell me how they just appreciate the 100% of love that I've put into it, which is very kind. <laughs> But maybe someone in your family made something and forgot a crucial ingredient and you didn't tell, have the heart to tell them how undelicious it was. <laughs> we try and be very polite in those moments. But in his book, How People Grow, um, psychologist, Christian psychologist, Dr. Henry Cloud, is such a great book and he really um, summarises a picture or the ingre- of the ingredients God uses for character and relational growth in our lives. I'm gonna put it up on the screen because it's a really helpful thing to remember. Um, Grace plus truth over time equals growth. Grace plus truth over time equals growth. And this series we're talking about, you know, how do we grow healthier in our relationships as we grow more like Jesus? So understanding the process of growth and the ingredients that must be present for growth to happen actually can save us a lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration. Because sometimes like when we miss out an ingredient when we're cooking, we miss out one of those things and we're, getting, we're thinking, why is this not changing? Why am I not growing? Why is this not improving? When actually God wants all three to be present for growth, for character and relational growth. Do you know, Henry Cloud, I'm gonna read you a quote. He says, whenever God has intervened in human history to redeem us and to help us, He does it with these three ingredients, grace, truth and time. In fact, these three ingredients can be seen in the very nature of the person of Jesus and what He did with us. As John describes Christ Jesus and what He did, He says the following, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's in John chapter 1. The very character of Jesus is one that includes exactly what we need to grow, grace and truth. And when He came to visit us and intervene in our lives, He dwelt with us. He spent time in the process with us. And thank goodness He still does even now. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when we fell away from Him, He has a, had a plan that included His grace, His truth, and a lot of time to work it out. Very insightful. What is grace? You might be here and you've come along to church for the first time, you've been coming the last few weeks and you think, yeah, I know that song, Amazing Grace, or you're watching online. I've heard that song before, but what is grace? Well, grace is simply stated unmerited favour. It's when someone is for us and not against us. When we don't have to earn or strive or perform to have someone's favour or kindness. It's freely given. God's grace has to do with His relational character. 
He desires relationship with us. That's just (laughs) mind-blowing. The holy, holy, holy one that we sang about this morning desires relationship with us. And He offers it to us freely, though we don't deserve it. He does this because He gave His Son as an atoning or in our place sacrifice to secure salvation for us so we could be freely forgiven. He desires to be with us and for us to know Him personally. And because of His grace, He wants to help us and give to us and He wants that for every person in the world, whether they choose to come to know Him or not. God doesn't love us transactionally. God doesn't love us transactionally, only if we can give something back to Him. Only if we can give, there's some benefit for Him because He doesn't actually have any needs that we can meet. He's perfect. Out of His sheer goodness and kindness, His own will and for His own pleasure. This is God's word to you this morning. He loves you. He loves you. In Ephesians 1, in the Amplified, starting from the end of verse four, it says, in love He predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to Himself as His own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of His will to the praise of His glorious grace and favour, which He so freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, in His Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? We need to be, Christians need to be reminded of this. We don't just go back into the performance (laughs) trap of trying to earn God's favour. He gives it to us freely. We can receive it, we can accept it. Or we can forget it, dismiss it, ignore it, reject it. But it's in this rock solid relationship of grace. When we, have, when we begin this relationship of grace with Jesus, more and more we come to understand that we don't need to try and hide. We don't have to listen to shame. We don't have to pretend that we have it all together. Praise God, because who knows we don't. We don't have to try and be driven. We can let go of trying to be driven to make this good impression on others because God already loves us. I wanna read you a quote by Tim Keller. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty that life could throw at us. There's a reason why people keep coming back to Romans 8 again and again and again. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ. In the embrace of God's grace, we can start to unlearn patterns of relating that are destructive and unhelpful. And we can continue to learn godly ways of relating even when it requires risk and vulnerability and courage. And I remember when I first came into this church family that uh, it was really in that first year of giving my life to Jesus and following Him when, when God started to show me that I was, it was safe to be able to start to unpack and face some of the grief that I was feeling about my mum's death and some of the self-hate pictures that I had of myself and in a place of acceptance where the people of God came alongside me and around me and I knew that no matter what happened, even if I put something out there that was a bit scary or vulnerable, that I was still gonna be loved and embraced and accepted. Do you know how much I grew? So much. Because this new identity we have in Christ as loved sons and daughters of God, it never changes. And if it never changes, then we are okay to start to look at the stuff that we've been doing that is not helpful or is hurting to us or others. Because we're never gonna be rejected. God will always embrace us. 
Some of you today here feel unlovable. But God's love for you is not based on how you feel and your own estimation of your deservedness. His love for you doesn't shift and wane based on how good you perform or how badly you mess up. God loves you because He chooses to love you. That's it, full stop. (laughs) And His love is most clearly seen and demonstrated in this. While you were of no use whatsoever to Him, Christ died for you. This is the grace of God. This grace that God so freely bestowed on us in Jesus and in the sending of His Spirit and the grace He deposits in us through friendship and acceptance in the family of God. It is essential for ongoing growth. It is essential. So is truth. Jesus said that He is the way, the truth and the life. And if Jesus is truth, then He is ultimate reality. His words, His actions, His example, His teaching, the Scriptures that point to Him, He is the truth and He tells us the truth. John 10.10 in the Amplified says, The thief or the devil comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they, anyone who comes to the Father, through Jesus may have life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Yet our culture continually feeds us the lie that an abundant free life is living independently from God. It's choosing your own adventure, whatever that looks like to you, that's a free life. But a life independent of God is not a free life at all. A life independent of God is actually a wasted life. That's what the Bible says. A life independent of God is actually an enslaved life. The truth is that real freedom is only found in surrendering and giving over control of our lives to the One who loves us and who made us for Himself. Let's have a listen to Romans 6 in their message. It puts it so well. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, as your last free act, but offer yourselves to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives, you've let sin tell you what to do, but thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in His kingdom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture, Paul says. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? (laughs) What did you get out of it? Nothing that you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do because Jesus Christ has set us free from the power of sin, we can actually say, no, I'm not gonna do that. By the power of the Spirit, I'm gonna follow God. You don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight, the delight, the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise. A whole healed put together life right now with more and more life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus our Master, wow. Pretty amazing. God's truth structures our lives. 
It shows us how God wants us to think and behave and act as His people and how we can grow more like Jesus. And when we listen to God's truth and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to do what He says, we're transformed and conformed more and more, day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, two feet forward, but one back, but we keep going to be more like Jesus. Grace is essential for growth and so is truth. But change is not instantaneous. Growth takes time. Have a listen to this quote again from Dr. Cloud. He says, grace and time together without truth will make you comfortable in your stuckness. Truth and time together without grace will discourage and break you. Grace and truth together without time will give you a vision and then not have you reach the completion of that vision. They must all go together. Are you comfortable in your stuckness? You need the truth of God's Word. Truth and time together without grace will discourage and break you, but it says grace and time together without truth will make you comfortable. Day by day, in community with others, you need the truth of God's Word. It's so easy to deceive ourselves. It's so easy to say, yeah, we're good. We need the truth of God's Word to be a mirror to our lives to show us where there's things in our hearts that are not pleasing to Him, but also how He wants us to live, the freedom He has for us. Do you need to get a Bible? Do you need to start a reading plan? Do you need to restart a reading plan? (laughs) Do you need to join a life group? Do you need to commit? I am gonna come to church every week. I don't care what's what tries to stop me, I'm gonna be here to sit under the ministry of God's Word, to let the truth of God penetrate my heart and life in a deeper way. Without truth, you can't grow. Are you discouraged and feel like you're always falling short, aware of all your failings? God's grace is available to you at all times. Receive it, accept it even if you don't feel like it sometimes. His power is made perfect in our weakness as we receive and rely on His grace. And there might be one or two supportive people that you need to connect with in this family so that you can experience grace with skin on. (laughs) That's what happened to me when I first came into this church. I experienced grace with skin on as people who looked me in the eye and heard me talking about some of the things I was doing or things I was feeling still kept looking at me and said, God still loves you. They didn't walk away. Who do you need to share with and approach and talk to to experience more of God's grace? Are you frustrated that you're not seeing change as quickly as you like? Don't give up. You're not where you used to be. Hallelujah. (laughs) You're moving forward. Unless you're stuck in your comfortableness, but you're moving forward. (laughs) I believe in a year's time when you look back and see the fruit of what you're now sowing by faith in response to God's Word, you're gonna be like, wow. What you're sowing by faith now into your relationships and what God's doing in your life, you're gonna see it. Really, really like, wow, I'm different. My relationships are different. James 1.21 says, In simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the Word, making a salvation garden of your life. Isn't that beautiful? Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Keep sowing in faith as, what, as God's showing you. Through this series, we've been comparing the qualities of wisdom two kinds of wisdom that the Bible talks about in James 3 and applying that to our relationships. And theologian N.T. Wright makes this observation about the two types of wisdom James talks about. He says, we're faced then with two kinds of wisdom. This may well be a word for our day when so many people across the world are fed up with the way their country is run, with the way their police force behaves, with the way the global economy functions and so on. Often these criticisms are fully justified as they certainly would have been in James' own day. But the challenge then for God's people is to be able to tell the truth about the way the world is and about the way wicked people are behaving 
without turning it into a perpetual grumble. And in particular, without becoming someone whose appearance of wisdom consists in being able to find a cutting word to say about everything and everyone. There is still, after all, a vast amount of beauty and love and generosity and sheer goodness in the world. Those who follow Jesus ought not only to be celebrating it, but contributing to it. As the saying goes, to light, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Such a powerful observation that we can easily fall into grumbling and complaining and, you know, bitter, bitter having the last word, bitter comebacks, you know, being really negative about everything that's going on around us. And the challenge is to be able to discern and speak the truth about what's happening, but not just sit as a bench side observer to contribute to the light of God that wants to penetrate the darkness. And in our relationships, the light of God that wants to penetrate the darkness and the unedifying behaviour, perhaps of other people. James 3, 17 to 18 says, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favouritism and is always sincere. The message paraphrase describes real wisdom. God's wisdom has been characterised by getting along with others. All of those things that that talks about in James 3 are about relational character traits. That's why we're talking about it for this series. But what does James mean by willing to yield to others, as some translations say, or reasonableness? What does he mean by this? Well, he gives us a clue in chapter one and it starts with being willing to listen. James 1 in 19, verse 19 to 20 in the Amplified says, understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. He's talking to people who are being persecuted. Let everyone be quick to hear, be a careful, thoughtful listener. Slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words and slow to anger, patient, reflective and forgiving. For the resentful and deep-seated anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, that standard of behaviour which he requires from us. In the message, I love how it just helps us see a, another uh, facet of the diamond of the truth of God's Word. In James 1, in the message as well, it says, post this at all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue and let anger straddle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger. How often do, I was thinking about that this week, how often do we reverse the order? Lead with your anger, follow up with your tongue and let listening straddle along in the rear. It's kind of funny, but kind of true. Being quick to listen is what comes first in verse 19. What is, why is this? Because listening is a posture of undivided attention. Listening is a posture of seeking to understand. Listening is being willing to learn and not presuming we already have all the answers. Listening involves our ears, but also our eyes and our other senses. And it requires intentionality and active engagement with people. It communicates that we value someone, that we see them and we hear what they have to say, whether or not we agree with what they have to say, that we see them and we hear what they have to say. Jesus spent a lot of time listening to people. He cared for every person who encountered Him, but also as He was listening to the person in front of Him, He was listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit and saying, how do you want me to respond next? He was enabled by the Spirit to hear the heart's cry behind questions, to discern the deeper spiritual need underneath the immediate and the urgent practical problem. He was able to perceive the hidden motivations behind animosity. He listened with his ears and his eyes and his heart. There's this amazing part in Mark 10 where a, a ruler comes up to him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, first of all, he calls Jesus good and he says, only God is good. 
In other words, saying, are you making, joining the dots? I am God in human form. <laughs> but um, he says, you know, you know what it says, obey the commandments and he lists out all these commandments and the man says, I've done all of these. Jesus didn't actually say the first commandment, which was, you shall have no other God before me. The man thought he was doing all the right outward behaviour, but Jesus saw through that and said, there's an idol in your heart. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. The idol in his heart was his wealth. He was unwilling to yield that, to find the treasure that is priceless following Jesus. But it says in that verse, in Mark 10, 20, just the first part, it says, before Jesus responded back to him and knew that he was missing the big idea of what he was saying, that there was this idol that he was willing, unwilling to lay down, Jesus, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Before he, before he challenged him and gave him a call to lay down this idol and come follow him, he looked at him and he loved him. There's so many accounts of Jesus being willing to take time to listen to people and at the same time he was listening to the Holy Spirit. We can do that. We can do that. I remember um, going to meet with uh, someone who was going through a really difficult time and I just felt that the Holy Spirit wanted me to just go and listen. So I'm sitting there listening and they're telling me everything about the situation, telling me everything about the situation. Before I'd been praying and saying, God, is there something that you want me to be prepared about? <clears throat> and I just felt the word resentment. And they're talking, they're talking, they're talking. They got it all off the chest. Um, and I just said, do you think there might be a way to explain how you're feeling is resentment? And it was like the floodgates opened and they just started bawling their eyes out and said, yes, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> and I think it was that combination actually of listening to someone, giving them space to talk, but also listening to the Holy Spirit that helped me know what to do next. <laughs> okay, let's pray. <laughs> Active listening means showing empathy, asking open-ended questions, giving our full attention, summarising back to someone what you've heard them say. The act of listening calms fears and begins to move people to work more cooperatively together even if they can't agree on all things. Listening builds trust. We don't trust people who don't understand who we are or how we feel. Listening is the key strategy for FBI hostage negotiation to de-escalate incidents and save lives. Just apply that to your relationships. <laughs> I'm going in as a hostage negotiator. I'm gonna be listening. <laughs> Give me everything you got. No. <laughs> the goal is to work with the person in crisis towards a more peaceful solution that previously seemed impossible. Does that sound like sometimes how our relational discussions go? Henry Cloud says five barriers to listening. Let's put them up. First is me first, me first. If you wanna go first all the time, that can be a barrier to listening. Self-referent, you're always having to refer back to yourself. Now, all of us do, do one of these things at some time, so none of us are perfect in this, okay? But do you refer back to yourself? When someone's trying to tell you something, do you refer back to yourself all the time? Interruptions, oh, <laughs> I struggle with this sometimes when I'm passionate about something and wanna share my thoughts and I'm like, would you stop talking? <laughs> Interruptions. Negation. That means to denial someone's statement. To deny someone's statement or how they feel. Um, minimising, which means to overlook or downplay the importance of what someone's saying. Do you know a great question to ask, Henry Cloud says, is, is this. If you take nothing else from this message, how about you try this this week? Is there anything I don't understand? Just wait for the answer. Is there anything I don't understand? In James 3, the phrase translated by some versions as being willing to listen is also translated willing to yield, easy to be entreated. 
The NIV translates this word as submissive. And in a culture that prizes my rights and my truth and my independence, the word submissive is reviled. But do you know what? In a society where some secular and even some Christian leaders, sadly, or institutions, and even in some marriages, have used the word submission to justify or excuse evil abuse, violence, controlling behaviours, dehumanisation or objectification. It's understandable why our world is wary. We are sometimes wary of that word. The Greek word translated willing to yield does not appear anywhere else in the New Testament. It means easily obeying, compliant. It's also translated as open to reason and ready to be convinced. How frustrating is it to speak to someone who comes across like they're a religious know-it-all? What do you reckon? It's frustrating. What James is talking about is the opposite. It's about not being stubborn or obstinate, about having a yielding disposition in all indifferent things, not talking about things that are morally wrong, okay? He isn't meaning we should compromise when God says things are wrong. Willing to yield describes the wise individual whose mind is not closed and is willing to listen to others. He or she knows that truth has nothing to fear from hearing other viewpoints. Even when they don't accept everything that they hear as being the truth, they are grounded in the Word of God and can recognise blatant errors that go against Holy Scripture, as well as discern half-truths that can lead people away from focusing on Jesus. They will patiently listen to others. And if truth is presented, they will accept it. If error is presented, they will reject it, but they won't reject the person. James is saying wisdom from heaven looks like this. You won't need to react rashly towards someone who approaches you with a correction or a new idea. You're not stiff, stern, obstinate or unyielding. You won't take a position and then hold it self-righteously whether you're right or wrong. You are not a person where no arguments or persuasion can have any influence. You are not someone who can be affected by any appeals made to you on the grounds of justice and mercy, but are ready to yield when truth requires you to do it. You're willing to sacrifice your own convenience for the good of others. Walking in wisdom in our relationships means learning when it's actually wrong to apply the strict letter of the law because the Pharisees applied the strict letter of the law and missed it. And none of us looks at the Gospels and goes, I wanna be more like the Pharisees. We wanna be more like Jesus. This submissiveness, this willingness to yield is only a posture that you can choose to take. No one can force you to take it. Because you can outwardly do all the right things but be unsubmitted in your heart. Are you stiff, stern, obstinate or unyielding in your relationships with others? Do you always have to have the last word? Or with a particular person, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to yield when truth, mercy and obedience to the Father requires it? I wanna finish with the yieldedness of Jesus because we need Him, right? (laughs) Jesus, we need you. Thanks for picking that song, Laura. Cracker. How we need the Spirit's help to be more like Jesus. The Spirit of God helped Jesus choose the way of wisdom, though it cost Him so much. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, He paused to listen again to His Father and ask if there was another way. Another way to achieve our salvation, a way less painful, a way that was less distressing, a way that meant He wouldn't be abandoned and shamed and wounded a way that meant He wouldn't be scourged and disfigured with a horrible whip and tortured with a crown of thorns, a crowd shouting crucify with nails in His hands and His feet, the weight of our sin and the spiritual darkness that came upon Him, some other way that that meant He wouldn't have to endure the horror of the cross. In Mark 14, 
We read about his time in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Daddy, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Luke describes it like this in Luke 22, he withdrew about a stone's throw from beyond them, that his, his, from beyond his disciples, he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. God couldn't answer Jesus' plea for some other way because this was the way that God had chosen for our salvation. Someone had to die a perfect sacrifice for our sin and in our place. But God wasn't deaf to Jesus' prayer. He sent him an angel to strengthen him, to say, this is the way and you're gonna have strength to endure it and you're gonna have peace in it that you're doing my will. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus was willing to yield to his Father. He knew he'd come from heaven to do his Father's will. And because he listened to his Father, because he yielded, we have a right relationship with God. I wonder if there's some areas where as we follow Christ's example, the eternal and lasting impact of the fruit of yieldedness to God in your relationships, you may not even ever know this side of eternity. But there'll be lasting fruit. Jesus is intimately acquainted with any grief and suffering you might be experiencing in your relationships right now. And thankfully, we know he did not stay dead. He is alive, hallelujah. He knows how to help us choose the path of wisdom when we wanna remain unyielding and obstinate. He knows we need to, his help to listen to others and that's why he sent us the Holy Spirit. And he is here by his Spirit. He's with you if you're watching at home. Nath, can you just come, just on keys? And I really felt that he wanted you to know this morning, he's listening to you. You have his full undivided attention. What do you wanna say to him? About anything that's going on in your relationships. You might just wanna close your eyes as Nathan plays. Just be quiet. What is it that you wanna say to Jesus? Cause he's here, he's with you. You want to tell him about the heartache you've been feeling. Do you want to tell him about your worry? Do you want to talk to him about how frustrated you felt? listening. You want to tell him how you can't do it without his help. Jesus, we need you.
Hebrews 5, verse 7 to 10, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save Him from death. And He was heard because of His reverent submission. Gethsemane is the most moving example of the humble submission which characterised Jesus' whole life. Son though He was, the Scripture says, He learned obedience. He was always obedient, but in that moment, it was like the fullness of that obedience was seen. He took His obedience up to death to the point where it could be taken no further. He learned obedience from what He suffered and once made perfect. And it's not talking about moral perfection because Jesus is sinless, but it's talking about the completion of this process, His life, His death and His resurrection. He fully qualifies as our Saviour because He fully identifies with our suffering and our pain. He knows how you're feeling. He entered into it. He says, once made perfect, or fully qualified, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey Him. The way of Christ is the way of surrender and obedience to His will. Not to earn our place, but in response to His grace. To choose not to be unwilling to yield. To choose not to be unwilling to listen. And He's listened to you. And I feel that He would be saying to us this morning, my Father and your Father's will is His very best for you. Will you choose it? You will never regret it. And if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, you can lay down your will and say, Jesus, I want to surrender to You. Right now, if you're watching at home, you can say, Jesus, I've heard today of how You love me. I've heard today of how You've forgiven me. I've heard today of how You laid down Your life and were willing to yield so I could know God. So I stop running for you from You and I give You my life. I believe upon You. I thank You that You died for me and I receive Your salvation, I come under Your leadership. If you prayed that prayer, You're a follower of Jesus. You're a Christ follower. He's never gonna leave you. He's never gonna forsake you. I'd love us just to finish. Laura, you come as well on the team by singing that song, Jesus, I Need You. Where is that situation, that relationship where you are yielding to Jesus and saying, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but Yours be done. Where do you need to extend mercy? Where do you need to reject error and hold on to truth, but be willing to yield? Is there anything you need to understand or see differently? Maybe you need to go and ask someone for their godly counsel instead of trying to work it all out by yourself. Let's sing this song together. Why don't we stand? You sing it at home, you might wanna stand. Lift up your voice. Let's put our reliance upon Jesus and ask and call out for His help in our relationships. Thank You, Jesus. We rely on You. We rest in You in Jesus' Name.